Well, my name is Ellen Poston, and I am a, I guess, first and foremost, I'm a Christian. Then I'm a mom and a wife and a Nina. Being a Nina is my favorite thing. I have five grandchildren. I love to read. I love to um, do things with my family. Um, we sort of all live really close together, and so it seems like my grandchildren are always at my house. Well, it's really crazy. It was in July, late July of 2020. Um, and I just really started feel felt like I had a UTI or either a yeast, yeast infection. And so I called the doctor and I said, you know, I got something going on. And so they tested me for both those things and said, no, you don't have it. You know, you're good. So that was August. Then the 1st of September, I had my yearly physical. And when my blood work came back a couple of weeks later, they called and said, oh, yeah, you've got a UTI. We're going to start you on some antibiotics. And so I'm like, OK, but I hadn't really had any major symptoms then. And so then just over the next through the end of 2020, I just kept had a couple of UTIs. And so I decided to make an appointment at my gynecologist instead of just my family practitioner. And um, he, they said I had um, a um, infection and give me some medicine for a bacterial infection, I think. And then they said I had a yeast infection and gave me medicine for that. And so that just sort of, I saw him a few times and then I was just like, well, that's not helping me get any better. So, you know, obviously that's not it. And I had started feeling like I couldn't, like maybe it was urine and not dis vaginal discharge. And so um, I thought, well, okay, you know, that's probably what it is. You know, I'm having all these UTIs. And so through 2021, you know, just sort of messed back and forth with you, um, UTIs and discharge just got worse. Um, and I guess one thing that was really important for me to do this is because through all of this discharge, I never really saw blood. It was just a clear discharge. And so it didn't make the connect with me that it might be vaginal because I have, was postmenopausal for 13 years already. So, you know, I really just thought all of that was behind me. I didn't even think about that. And at that time, my mother was sick and she moved in with me. And, you know, she was was incontinent she was in her late 80s and so um I just thought well you know that's this is what's happening to me and since the UTIs were really becoming more you know what I thought was the UTI it wasn't it didn't turn out to be it turned out to be the cancer getting worse but um my family practitioner said you know I think it's time we go to a urologist. And so I went to see the urologist and he's like, oh, you know, I think, you know, this really worries me. Let's schedule a cystoscope. He did it and he came back in the room. He said, there's nothing wrong with your cystoscope. You don't have anything wrong with your bladder. He said, if you would just lose weight, you wouldn't have to worry about incontinence. And um, I was like, you know what? I've been overweight from all of my adult life. And this has never happened to me before, but I can assure you, I'm not going to be back here. But so I just left, went straight to the car and called the gynecologist and said, okay, I need another appointment. You know, this is vaginal. We got to do something. So we, I saw him like within maybe two weeks and he said, well, you know, he did, then he scheduled a transvaginal ultrasound um, and said, well, you know, your lining is really thick. It was like 11 centimeters for a postmenopausal woman. I think it's like four centimeters that are millimeters, whichever it is, that is abnormal. And um, he's like, let's just put you on some progesterone. And I said, no, I'm not taking progesterone. I told you many years ago, I was not taking that anymore. And um, so he said, well, 
let's just, he said, let's just do a DNC. And he said, and, you know, then we'll put in a Marina IUD, which we had done in 2008 and had worked great. And um, so we did that like the next week. So I remember it was May the 12th because it was a Thursday and May the 13th was, well, when the DNC was over, he came out and he said, he told my husband and then told me and later, he said, we'll talk when the pathology report comes back. He said, I don't like the looks of it. And um, so then he called me on Friday afternoon and said, you know, I'm sorry to have to tell you this, but you have endometrial cancer. He said, but, you know, don't worry about it. You know, we probably got it early. You know, it's not a big thing when you catch it early. And so I was like, okay. I said, but how, he, you know, he said it's slow growing. And I just kept saying to him, but how slow is slow? You know, because I know that I've been having symptoms that I can feel for almost two years. So how slow is slow? So um, that was on Friday. I got in to see there's Charlotte has Levine Cancer Institute. And I got in to see actually she turned out to be the head of the department on Wednesday and um, scheduled a hysterectomy for July the 11th. They did that. and. When she came out, my sister was with me because, you know, we're still COVID restrictions. And so my husband does not drive to Charlotte. So my sister was with me and um, she came out and told my sister, she said, oh, you know, we're not done here. Um, I had like a, um, a big tumor and she keeps using her fist as her way she describes it that big. And then I had told my gynecologist, I'd said, that tumor's on my left side, isn't it? And he said, oh, no, Ellen, it's not a tumor that you can see. And I said, okay, well, and it turned out that the lymph node that the cancer had spread to was on the left side, and it was where it hurt. And um, so um, it had spread to my cervix and to that one lymph node. So, and then when the pathology report came back, it is a, a grade three. So I'm stage three C and it is a grade three, which is a more aggressive cancer. And um, we were coming home from the meeting after the pathology report came in to see my doctor. And um, my daughter-in-law at, at the time, said, um, you know, if you hadn't have been proactive about this, if you hadn't have pushed, they would have let you die, you know, and I really just, that is the truth. That is, I said, <laughs> I have really tried to put all of that because they're, I say, I don't need that kind of negativity in my life. So I've really tried to let that go because I can't fight the fight right now being bitter or upset about the past. Um, I will say that I know that doctors are in a, a big hurry and they have a whole lot to deal with. Um, but I just wish that all medical people would not just look at someone's size and assume that if they would just lose weight, their problems would go away. And even like, and not just assume that you don't know what's going on in your body, that you haven't lived in your body. I'm 62 years old. I mean, I knew something was wrong. So I don't know how to make people listen to your concerns. Even if you go through a whole bunch of tests and it comes back, that's nothing, then great, great. But had somebody listened to me a little bit earlier, we could have gotten this cancer while I was still in a stage one. You know, so now, you know, I'm in a stage three. And so, yeah. I don't know. Maybe I haven't processed it yet. <laughs> I 
I never really thought it wasn't a UTI. And, you know, there's all these commercials now about, you know, things to take for UTIs. And I never really thought that that wasn't what it was until the urologist said, you have not been having any UTIs. Your bladder does not show that. And so, I, um, you know, so my a family doctor wouldn't really, because I was growing a culture every time, you know, it grew something different. And um, so a family doctor, that is not their expertise, you know, and a gynecologist would have, I think, put all of the pieces together. So, which is another reason why women need a gynecologist. Well, um, I really have a wonderful, wonderful gynecologist oncologist. And she just came in and she said, Ellen, she said, you are going to lose your hair, but we've got medicine for everything else. So, you know, we will work through it and we'll, you know, get the met, you know, we will treat your symptoms. And um, I did really get nauseous the first treatment, but you know, there is good nausea medicine. Um, my hair did fall out. I sort of got proactive about that a little bit. I started cutting it shorter. And then as it started coming out, I just shaved it off because I could not stand my hair being on everything. And um, we're really good. They um, gave me, um, well, my family had given and friends had given me a surprise chemo party. And it was a surprise party on Sunday before my chemo started. And everybody, you know, everybody who is somebody to me was there. It was a big, wonderful party. And one of the things they had as decoration was a ball of Barbie. And um, all of my granddaughters just loved it. And so when we were down and, you know, and talking to the pharmacists and to the nurse navigators, you know, getting ready for the chemo, they gave me enough bald Barbies for all of my granddaughters to have their own bald Barbie. So they all really loved them and played with them, you know, so that sort of helped. That helped prepare them for the fact that Nina was going to look different for a while, you know, so that was really good thing um it was really kind of sad and I, I know that's been this way for every cancer patient since COVID but to have to go in there and take that treatment and it lasted for six hours by yourself was just it was so hard um and I saw something on here I didn't even know it was the thing was chemo dread about how you just have such a a bad feeling the day of chemo or when you even would think about a chemo treatment was coming up, you know, that really bad feeling, but um, that was a very real thing. Yeah, I had carboplatin and Taxol and I had six cycles of it, you know, every three weeks. Um, the first one made me really sick and the, steroid just really made me feel bad but then for the last five cycles um the steroid kept me feeling good for three days three days that you took the steroid I felt good on those days then the fourth and fifth day were really bad and then you know then you started feeling a little bit better um I told the nurse navigator I think maybe after the or before the third cycle or fourth, I don't remember, but I said, I'm just so tired. It just makes me so tired. And she said, well, she said, usually the people who stay as close to their regular schedule as can do the best. And I said, well, I just tell you till I work all day and I get home and get supper, I'm just wore out. And um, she said, oh my God, you're working? And I said, yeah, I am. But I did try to work. I missed a few days every cycle and then I would work. And as the cycles progressed, the harder it was to 
you know, work and I would be so tired and I'd be asleep early and, you know, just sleeping for a long time. I remember telling my doctor, I was like, oh my God, I, I sometimes I go to bed at six o'clock at night and I sleep till six o'clock in the morning. And she said, well, you know, you're tired. You know, that's not strange. It's not abnormal to, you know, need that much sleep. So I took a Claritin every day and that really helped with the bone pain. Yes, that helped. Um, and, you know, as the treatments progressed, my nausea was less. Like the last treatment, I almost had no nausea. Um, really, for me, the hardest thing was the fatigue. The And I don't, and fatigue is not a good word to describe it. It was just such bone deep weariness that going getting up and getting to my chair was an effort and you know you just had to sit down going to the bathroom and back to the chair was an effort being able to get in the shower was a no-go for a couple of days I mean because you're just I you know I just can't even I don't even have a word to describe how that felt at a scan at the end of those six cycles and I have had no evidence of disease. I just had a scan last week and I still have no evidence of disease. So that is really great. It was, well, honestly, to tell the truth, I was so sick and I felt so bad that all of the people in my life were much more excited about it than me because I was just felt so bad that it was hard to just be totally excited. But, um, and it still, that still seems a little unreal to me, I guess. Um, I think that still seems a little bit unreal. But then I had that at the end of December and then I started my 25 radiation treatments in January. The first week of that, I was so tired. I just could not function. I thought, oh my God, there's no way I'll be able to do 25 of these treatments. But then after those first couple of days, then they were no, I had no real symptoms other than I did have some, well, I did have bad diarrhea, but it the diarrhea seemed like not much after the chemo tiredness. So I did have diarrhea. If you're a woman, you need a gynecologist because I made that mistake. This is totally on me. Is that when I had maybe 10 years post menopause, I thought, I don't need a gynecologist anymore. You know, I'm not having a period. I have had zero issues. You know, I don't, I can just let my family doctor do that. And I made that decision. And that was a bad, bad decision that I will have to have the repercussions of it for the rest of my life because I let it go. Now, you know, you can't go back and rewrite history. So I don't know. It may not have made any difference because, you know, they may have just let that go because, but we should not, women should not ignore their fem, feminine health, you know, um, whether that's a mammogram or a pap smear, um, you know, and if something, if something's just not right, we need to have had a doctor who we're seeing regularly who knows us so we do need that really just the main thing is is you just have to be an advocate for yourself because when any doctor that you see sees you I don't you know they have a lot of patients in a day and you have just got to be able to say no wait a minute this is wrong this is wrong if you push enough, you're going to get in and get somebody to listen to you about something. So, um, yeah, you just have to keep pushing and stand up for yourself. Well, I would say that 
it is very important to have faith that when you are facing such a big diagnosis, I'm not really sure how people faced it without faith because for me, panic was such a major thing. I just felt, I would feel it rising inside of me to panic because there was so much to panic about. And, you know, if I, if I let that panic take over, there is still so much to be panicked about because, and this is important too, did you realize that there are more women die of endometrial cancer now than ovarian cancer? And, you know, an endometrial cancer does not have the same press as breast cancer or ovarian cancer, but it is, st it is such, you know, something that we need to put as much emphasis as the other three. And um, so it is still very scary. And, and I know everybody handles it differently, but for me, my faith, gave me that peace you know and it's it's hard to I guess the Bible says it's a peace that passes all understanding and so I can't explain it but that did give me peace in the middle of this journey <laughs>